Um, can I ask you a ridiculously big question about your field that like there's probably no answer to at all? Oh my god, yes, please. <laughs> okay. I will find an answer. <laughs> okay. Well, like you, apparently you do all of these like insane, you know, TV appearances having to answer like the questions that other people want you to answer. Mm -hmm. But like for you and like for the field, like what are like the biggest most interesting questions that people are are here to really discover? Like what mm. what are the mystery cuz like you work on a field that is is not it, it, it raises like the really deep, profound questions about like what is the origins of civilizations and things mm. like that. And ignorant people like me have no idea like where the field stands currently mm. on, in a, on a big picture level. So like what for you are like the most interesting yeah. questions that you guys, if you can answer any of them, you mm. would. Okay, so this is this is a big question, it's like massive, you said, massive. massive. So you, I mean, can, you can take it however you want. It depends on the person, right? So some people are really they love the, the the kind of more classical history they want to know about the pharaohs and the kings and the you know jewels and the the fine art and the the, right. the, the high high society right. and for those people they usually really really want to find more intact tombs of the pharaohs okay like they want to find another king tut's tomb that's like boom that's what they want to find but is that because it brings them like individual fame for being the good person who who found mm. this this character or is it because it adds some like crucial link to our understanding of human history i mean it adds a well i mean it would depend on the person um go. i think some people it might be i mean i don't even think it's the fame because if you want to be famous you don't don't become an egyptologist like that's not like a route to fame i don't, like, know. I don't know you're apparently on tv all the time now so <laughs> well that's not fame i mean it's just like a little bit of like a discovery channel or an at geo thing and i just started in the last you know year or a bit like that's not a route to fame it's okay sure you know it's it's more like fun public communication okay you know if you want to be famous you know get a get a podcast <laughs> yeah okay 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 um so i think it's more, there's so many questions about the grandeur of, of, of the pharaohs and, and their afterlife beliefs and, and you know, this kind of idea that, that Tut was, I mean, historically speaking, not, he was, not a, I don't want to say minor king, but he didn't live very long and he was in a time of transition. And so people think like, oh my God, well, like what would like Ramses II's, you know, burial assemblage, what would that look like? Or, you know, they want to find intact tombs right. because that tells so much about burial customs, afterlife funerary goods like all this kind of stuff so i mean that's some people's like major attraction yeah. other people would love to find like the big tombs that we haven't found like cleopatra alexander the great you know these kind of things yeah we were brought we for were, one on nefertiti yeah we were nefertiti. brought to the we had to go a couple years ago with reuters we were brought together for the what's his name christopher reeves we had to meet <laughs> no, him that's superman no <laughs> nicholas reeves, nicholas reeves. <laughs> It's not my field. And it was like six years ago. Yeah. Sorry, Nicholas Reeves. Yeah. You elevated him. He's I, Superman now. He was a Superman hero to me. But he had a superhero like like fascination with yeah. my like, ego, actually. Yeah. Uh, this... Oh, damn. You was... I had to. I mean, we had to listen to him. Yeah, okay, right. No, I don't. It's not. It's not I, he wasn't taking anything from us. But he, yeah. was, he was obsessed with this idea that, you know, yeah. you obviously know the story better than us, that Nefertiti's yeah. uh, was buried in some room behind. I don't think they ever. They, but it, they it ended up true. not finding yeah. it. Yeah. They ended up not finding it. Yeah. It was. It they sent us thing. both to yeah. uh, to cover the oh. story a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. How was that? We got a free trip to Luxor and then we got put in a hotel. So that's fantastic. It was great. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but at it, like, I mean, so I mean, I'm curious. Like, what's it like when you cover one of these things? Is it like a big show? Is it a production? Yeah, like, what is yeah. that? What it's, is that vibe like? It's. it's 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 nonsense. Like what we were really were sent there to do is to hype up the story. Mm -hmm. Like when the titles were all like, "Could this be the final yeah. resting grounds?" All based on one guy's theory. But we yeah. all the media went there. We all interviewed yeah. him. They brought out the the minister, and they the minister didn't seem to really believe in the theory that much. But so he was caught in this interesting position of wanting to promote the story because it was good yeah. for Egypt. But you could tell he didn't believe it. So he was giving um, these kind of like weird. Well, it's also comments. important to be you know cautious at the same time because you're like, mm -hmm. whoa, we just don't know. Yeah. Mm. So it's, it's it's always a weird experience because, like as as a journalist, at least me, I went there and I don't really know much about ancient Egypt or mm -hmm. like how sure they are that this could actually be the tomb. For me, it was just like it was it was more like a job and 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 ancient Egypt is obviously very fascinating. Yeah. And at some point, I got to go into the tomb, uh, the Tutankhamun tomb, and I was like, oh my god, this is so beautiful. I'd never been, you know. <gasps> yeah. So. Uh, it's a bit of a it's a it's 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 kind of a weird trip where you feel like you're removed mm. out of like real life and sent into like some weird fantasy world because yeah. there were like <laughs> Japanese people there scientists they I believe yeah. the was like yeah. yeah it was like 
you know, machines of some kind, like going, you know, trying to find something, you know, underneath the ground. So I don't know. The whole vibe was just, it was just weird. It was like fantasy. Yeah. It was cool. It was cool, though, to see like active work on a real theory happening in real time, which I have yeah. never experienced. So I was fascinated yeah. from that perspective. Because if he, what if he's right and we're covering it? That's Yeah. I mean, it is it is a big risk, you know, but at the same time, I do. It would be nice if people were open minded about, you know, like, yeah, well, it could be. Let's let's check it out, which is, you know, what they did. They checked it out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like, but never for the record, tomb. that story ended. I think it was like a broom closet that they found. It was something yeah, it was like, like it was like not. It was like it was another like a, chamber that yeah, was behind, yeah, and yeah. you know, yeah. it was the, a big disappointment. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I it, mean, yeah. Compared to the like search, the hype. The search yeah. continues. Yeah. I mean, you learn something more about Tut's tomb. So that in itself is something yeah. that's cool. Sure. It's just, you know, it's not Nefertiti's tomb. So like Nefertiti's tomb, people would love to find that. Yeah. You know, things like this, people, that's like a dream. Mm. For me, yes. separate story. Uh, and for a lot of other archaeologists, we're, we're becoming more interested in life in ancient Egypt. Okay. Or like how did people live? What was, the, what was their life really like? And we're also really interested in how did ancient Egypt function? Okay. Like, okay, so you know you know the pharaohs and we, we, we know a lot about the, the kind of top level of society. But how did the state work? How did the administration work? How did money move around? How were taxes collected? How did the bureaucracy function? Was there, you know, a lot of uh, moving around bureaucracy in sort of sideways manners uh or you know were things more straightforward how did how did this how did this work so that's like a major focal point of research that people want to understand the politics and the administration of ancient egypt okay. and mm-hmm. the economy so that's a major research question and that's one where documents help a lot so more excavations that find like texts and you know those can be really helpful and then there are like okay so in ancient egypt There was no lock and key kind of business. They had the seal. And the ancient Egyptian word for the stamp, it's hetem, just like, you know, in Arabic. Yeah, it's crazy. So the hetem was there. And you would have a a wrap and you would have some mud and you would have your steel, your, your, your seal stamp. And then those, when you open that package or that thing or the whatever, you break it off and then you'd still have the mud sealing. Okay. So those are great things for archaeologists to find. They can reconstruct the names of people, their administration, their title, what kind of goods maybe it was connected with. So that's like a big thing that people look for. And, you know, documents, they want to understand administration. Um, I think just excavating houses are incredibly fascinating. Like, because, okay, so when you when you think about Egypt, it's a narrow strip of land on the Nile Valley. So you've got, you know, the flood banks on both sides. And this is the center of population now, just as it was the center of population in ancient Egypt. So a lot of ancient Egyptian cities are underneath what's going on, you know, the the current city. So you can't excavate a lot of settlements. Mm. So we we have, this led to like 50 years ago, there were early, early archaeologists that were like, there were no cities in ancient Egypt. And this was like an actual theory that was like floating around. This was a society without cities. And it's like, mm. how did that, <laughs> how did that get overturned? Like someone just was. Well, yeah, they found cities. <laughs> and obviously it was like, of course, the text oh, mentions cities. Course, yeah. They found them. It's just, you know, just because you don't find, you know. Mm. So it, the Delta has been a big change with that. Like excavating the, the, the Nile Delta, there's, there's big cities that have been right. uncovered. And, so there are cities that have been excavated, but they're a little bit out into the desert. And those big cities are generally connected with, like, big state projects. Like uh, if Nefertiti is a good example. So Akhenaten, Nefertiti's husband, he moved the capital. And he, you know, from the Cairo area, from Memphis. And he changed all the religion to the one god, Aten. And he made a whole new capital in the middle of Egypt, near Minya. And he built a new city kind of out in the desert. So that city, because it's out in the desert, no one built on top of it, hmm. people excavated it and you have like the whole city. And that's very cool. But it was only occupied for like 25 years or whatever. Hmm. Um, so what, that... What, what's, it, what's it like? Oh, it's... It's really... Like from whatever from, from, from whatever has been gathered so far, like what, in what it, ways is it fascinating? <laughs> it seems... Okay, so to understand why it's fascinating, it's also un- to understand how it's different. Because okay. a lot of the other cities that have been built for state projects, like temples or things, they're very pre-planned. Like it's a rectangular and they have the, the pre-planned blocks of housing. And it's 
it seems like Amarna was so different. This this uh, town is called Amarna. What, what period would this be? This is New Kingdom. So like year range would be. So about what, this would remember, be. You're talking to very ignorant people. Here. <laughs> I'm sorry, but like just no. so we're all on the same. No, <laughs> this is like the um, the 13th century BC. Okay. So this is this is like a whole new city that was developed, but it seems to be not as pre-organized and pre-planned as before. So you've got windy streets and you've got big people's like rich housing estates and you've got smaller houses clustered around. And then you have like some areas where it's actual like working class people. They, mm. They've excavated and found that they were doing all this craft production and they were involved in the economy in so many different ways. And, and you know, you can see like how they would have worked together with the state. So that like really helps understand that that it wasn't like Super planned. It wasn't, it, it was planned, but not super, like, there's this idea, you see the pyramids, right? And you think, mm-hmm. okay, you got the pyramids. <clears throat> it must be this, like, massive top-down organization. Right. Where we have the pharaoh controlling everything, and everything was organized. There would have been a massive factory for this, and a big thing for that, and da, 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 right. all overseen. But Amarna shows that, like, it wasn't really like that. Like, a lot of households were also making stuff in their 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 houses that would have gone back to... You know, the state. So, for example, like inlay, like the little inlay tiles for furniture, inlay tiles for architecture that were made out of faience. You know, faience, the. the what, 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 faience is like a beautiful, it's like a bright, normally it's bright, bright blue green. It's like a, it's a, it's not ceramic. It's a mostly made out of quartz mm, and okay. silica and it's like a glazed material. So, tiles. Some kind of tile. Yeah, it's like, but they could make it to be pots or little figures. Ah, like, you know those hippos like that you see? Her. It's No, that's pottery. Oh, ah, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm like way off. <laughs> way off. It's it's a, a glazed ceramic material. It's white on the inside, but the outside is colored, and it can be normally blue-green, but you can make it yellow, you can make it red, you can make it whatever color. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so it's like you used it for tiles, you used it for making little jars, figurines, mm. uh, amulets are often made out of them, mm. okay. stuff like that. Is that where they put the brains? That, no, the brains, they take it out of the brain. They but then they the, put it in a thing, right? They put... On like some kind of... The organs are put in a jar. Oh, okay. And those are called canopic jars. Okay. And they're like, they can be stone or pottery or whatever. Mm-mm. That could be faience. I don't know if there are any faience ones. But Mm-mm. I mean, so anyway, they, these inlay tiles are things they were made... Okay. In the mm. the city, in the houses, some of them. And then the similar tiles are found in the palace area. Okay. So you can connect like, oh, they were making some of it. We found the molds. Mm. They, not we. Mm-hmm. They found them. Barry Kemp is a major Egyptologist in Cambridge. Uh, he just directed the excavations for this. Um, so they fa- he found the, the molds and things that they were making them there, but it was sent to the palace. So we understand that it's like a loose network. And a lot of Egyptologists are coming out with ideas of, Things were not as top-down controlled. It was a lot of, you know, networks of patronage and, like, local big guys that would, like, control areas and then they liaised with the state. And, you know, we're trying – we're understanding things on a more ground level. Okay. Which is really cool. Yeah. Because, like, I mean – so my my dissertation was on um, the organization of the economy and pottery production and pots were, like – a very low socioeconomic status people made pottery. So to understand how they fit into the state with their labor. Like I looked at how temples got their pottery, like their beer jars and things like that. So anywho, yeah. we like found that, you know, to, to, to research this, this, this idea is something new and exciting. And a lot of people are, are engaging in this. So more cities, more work sites, more life is what, you know, we want to know about. And I think, I'm so fascinated by ancient Egyptian life, not really ancient Egyptian death and burial as okay. much, mm. um, which is super important. I mean, like that's another major important aspect of research, but it's not, you know. Okay. Mm. Is that is that like a general trend in the field that it's moved in that direction in recent years? More or? and more people have moved in that direction. I mean, of course, there's a lot of people that love tombs and mummies and things, and that is not going to go away, yeah. and nor it should it, because it's something that is like really cool. Right. But more and more people are are looking at hmm. The okay. life of ancient Egyptians. Um, mm. uh, sort of unrelated to that. Did they really drink beer? Sorry. No. Oh my God. Yeah, they drank so much beer. Okay. That's okay. so cool. So much. <laughs> so I Egypt, mean, Egypt is the birthplace of beer? Or, or is that a Yeah. Full? No, I mean, that's, it is. So I that's, mean, that's not a rumor or anything started by the BBC. <laughs> 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 there was a recent, like, massive brewery complex. It's, like, super old, like, from 3000 BC. Um, I mean, Mesopotamia was earlier in general, but you did, know. But did they have beer there? Oh, yeah. Okay, so Egypt isn't the birthplace of beer, like the origin. Well, I mean, or we don't know. 
I don't think it's like confirmed who first started it, but it's among the first, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. it is a major, but I mean, beer, it varied in strength. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it could be like booza from like the countryside. Mm-hmm. That's like a, yeah. not really very strong. They like have a booza light... here now. Oh yeah. Did you know that? Really? I mean, yeah, I'm there's, sure this, there's yeah. this Turkish place that has booza here. Yeah. Really? Yeah. It's quite good. Like a restaurant? Um, it's not a restaurant. It's more of like a, like a sh- small how you, like well, a, now like a, there are branches of it popping everywhere. You can oh, find them on those on the way uh, gas stations sometimes. Yeah, yeah. very yeah. cool. What's well, it called? Rahmani? Rahmani, yeah, the place yeah. called. Oh. There used to be just one uh, in Sayyidah Zainab, and for some reason, the past couple of years, they just started popping uh, up in different gas stations, all owned by the military, which I, I don't really uh, well, understand. Well, that and, is and, and, and I, that is quite yes. interesting. And like, I think they have trace amounts of the alcohol in it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so some of it is like very weak is yeah. source of calories. Yeah. And then there was also like, you know, beer that was stronger, beer right. that was flavored with stuff. Hmm. There was wine. I mean, yeah. you know, like... Is that, is that annoying, an, an, an annoying question that you get from people like me all the time? Did they drink beer? Like, <laughs> No, I... Because I, that... You, people want to know. Like, that's like yeah. an interesting... Like, I'm... Because it's so funny. We do want to know how people live. You know? Yeah, Which that's like... What, you're what did on. you eat? What did you drink? Yeah. Like, you know... I heard a lot of bread and a lot of beer. A lot of bread, a lot of beer, <laughs> yeah. a lot of, like, lettuce, grilled stuff, you know, like, fish. Yeah. And, you know, some duck. You know, like it, it, we we want to know what they mm-hmm. what, what life was like for the regular people. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, it seems like I mean, and it was a big thing. Like I mean, on you know, you have like excavations at the pyramids where, you know, the big breweries and and the the we have like, you know, uh, school exercises like handwriting exercises for for students their homework. Oh. Um, where they had to calculate, like scribes and training had to calculate the amount of beer that they could get for the barley <laughs> for different kinds of projects for people. Like it was a whole formula that, that the state oh, had, nice. you know, in order to feed all these people. So like it was a big thing. Mm. They definitely, yeah. Okay. Tons of beer. Cool. Go for them. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Sorry, I cut you off. No, no, you didn't cut me off. Yeah. <laughs> um, so like in the last few years, there's been so many of these like random finds that we find in the news. Oh, we know because we still have to cover these things. Yeah. And like obviously, again, we're not we're not Egyptologists, and we have like very little background in this. So we would just kind of have to do these stories on like yeah. this guy in his backyard found uh, a sarcophagus or something. So is it is there an unusually large number of things being found in recent years? Are we in some weird period of of discovery, or are they just getting better at promoting the finds? Um. There's a, there's been a long, long history of, of fines. I mean, there's stuff everywhere. So I think it's just a, a maybe getting better at promoting them. Yeah. And there's also been, I think, a bigger push from the Ministry of Antiquities to do more excavations. Okay. So they're, you know, they're digging more as, as mm-hmm. well. So okay. it's digging more and, and publicizing more. Is it mostly Egyptians or... or uh, my question is, actually, my question is, has it over the past few years become harder for foreigners to participate in in these kind of uh, um, uh, uh, you know works <laughs> well i mean the exciting thing is that more egyptian archaeologists are getting more opportunities that's, so that's, that's something that's, that's, that's like the bright side. Yeah. it's when, really when exciting change? um i think it's been a, a longer process of change yeah. um and it's still like there's a long way that that still needs to to go for, you know, access to participation, for funding uh, outside of, you know, external funding like grants and things like that. That's something that needs to be developed a lot more. Um, you know, Egyptian archaeologist participation in, in I mean, there has been a long history of, of you know, definitely since, like the site that, that we're working at now, Wadi al-Hudi, Ahmed Fakri is an amazing Egyptian Egypt, uh, Egypt, Egyptologist who was excavating there, you know, in the 40s. And so in, in the 40s, and for a long time, there's been some very key Egyptian archaeologists who've done amazing work, and it's well published, and, you know, they had their PhDs, and they did really good stuff. Yeah. But it seemed like there was kind of parallel trends with some of the challenges of, of academic Egyptology, is you have the people with the PhDs and the high positions at the universities who are publishing and working, but the kind of thing that we're seeing now more that's an exciting change is the Ministry of Antiquities is doing a lot more, a lot more excavations. Mm. And so that's bringing more people out to do work. And there's been extensive training programs since like the very early 2000s to bring more archaeological field method training to people in the ministry. And so that's like, this is now the fruit of that training Mm. in the early 2000s. So Mm. it's, it's starting to come where more and more and more people in the ministry are doing 
excavations on larger scales and things like that. Yeah. So it's it is like it is a change and it is an exciting time. Hmm. Okay. I think like Egyptology is going through a movement as it should, and I think most you know, it's most archaeological disciplines are inherently colonial. It started with a bunch of white people coming in. Yeah. Story of like Napoleon coming and opening exactly. up Egypt, right? And is in that the 18th is that narrative correct? That's like how I understand it. But this is just like that potted narrative you tell. Like, is that is that accurate? Well, in many ways it is. I mean, Napoleon came in the very late 1700s. I think it's 1798. Uh, maybe it's 1799. Six, eight, something like that. It's, it's, yeah. it's around that. It's a very, very, very late 1700s. Yeah. Very late 1700s. Yeah. And he brought his savants with him yeah. on his conquest mission. And they... So, so is, but is it true to say that there was like no work being done? And then he came no. and then opened it? Because that's kind of the way... No, I mean, the, the people people were aware of ancient Egypt. I mean, people, yeah. foreigners were in Egypt before then traveling to a much less degree uh, than, than it was after Napoleon. But there were certainly foreign travelers sure. uh, coming to Egypt, writing about stuff, writing about the pyramids. So people knew about it. And there were... Likewise, you know, Egyptian scholars that were writing even in the medieval period about ancient Egypt, right. you know, so there was a degree of awareness, but it was a like a lower level. I mean, there was, I would say, a boom after Napoleon and he okay. the, the description of Egypt, the description of Egypt was published yeah. and that became like, you know, then Europe kind of got Egyptology fever. Yeah. And then that kind of sparked a big push. And it's kind of been riding that wave ever since in a way. I mean, yeah. But that's what you mean by saying it's a, seen as a colonial enterprise. Yeah. So what you're seeing now is almost like a correction 200 years later or something. Well, there's, there's, I mean, it is nowhere near correcting it, sure. but it is, at least this is now becoming part of the conversation yeah. for Egyptology. Um, and there is like efforts to try to figure out how to undo some of this. Mm. And I mean, it is like, okay, I mean... We're going to like get real and talk about this. Yeah, um, please. Have there been any drawbacks? <laughs> please, yeah. please, 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 yes. All right. So like, all right. So when you do your PhD in Egyptology in the West, yeah. Europe, North America, you're, you, you know, you have to learn various stages of the hieroglyph language, Coptic, because that's a continuation of hieroglyphs and it's helped people decipher the language. But then your modern language of scholarship is English, French, or German. Yeah. Those are the languages that you learn and you have to take like your exam in English, French, and German. That's it. So you don't have to read a word of Arabic mm. in order to be an Egyptologist. Right. Uh, That's kind of fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that also leads in major publications. They accept most major Egyptology publications, accept articles in English, French, or German. But not Arabic. Yeah. Uh, even though the people here could be doing a lot of the work, and obviously they might only speak Arabic. I mean, but yes. And this is now where you have a big challenge is because there's been, you know, well over 100 years, 150 years or whatever, 200 years of writing about Egyptology, publishing of archaeological materials that are in English, French, and German. So you do kind of have to read those languages yeah. to yeah. access those sources, and it's impossible to translate them all. Mm. It's just way too many. Yeah. So at least there needs to be a reading knowledge of those languages. But the lack of bringing in, you know, publications in Arabic into Egyptology journals means that there, it, there's no common language of publication. This will be a separate thing. Hmm. And this is an ongoing problem that Egyptology doesn't really know how to fully address. So it's almost like you have uh, two different affect... communi communities not yeah. really talking to each other, like the external Egyptology field and then the local Egyptian field, and they don't always talk. Um, yeah, I mean, like foreign archaeologists work very closely with the ministry. In the ministry, you know, there's an inspector and there's archaeologists on board. So there is a connection. Um, every foreign excavation... There isn't, like, full access to information from both sides. I mean, if you, if you, if you can... I mean, yeah. most inspectors, mm. when they get to the level of doing excavation, you know, they, they do go to good universities. They, you know, have masters. They have things like this. Some, many have PhDs as well. Right. So there is, you know... There is a reading knowledge and there is an access to this information. Yeah. But having access to reading this information versus being able to write, mm. you know, is a different thing. So there's a lot of scholars in Egypt that are producing quality work, good publications in English, French, and German. Okay. And they're doing that. And that's great. But there is still another level of people that would probably be more comfortable writing in Arabic. That 
there are fewer outlets of publication to yeah. publish in. And those texts, if they do get published, they're not going to be read and understood by the foreign Egyptology community. Mm. So it creates kind of a challenge that's still there, that's very much from the colonial era, okay. that will be an ongoing challenge because you do have 150 years or more of scholarship in those languages. So that's a big issue. How do you move forward with that? I mean, you would think the easy answer is that everyone needs to be able to read and write Arabic. And that would be ideal. And, you know, it's challenging. And if it's something that if, if Egyptologists start, foreign Egyptologists start when they are younger, yeah. then it could, you know, you start in your bachelor's degree, it could maybe be a thing where, like for me, my German is a hot mess. Like, I mean, I pass my exams, but like when I have to read a German article, it's like, oh, Lord, help me. <laughs> like I have to sit there. It's like a mountain of coffee. I open up the thing and I have like Google Translate and I'm like copying and pasting and I'm like trying <laughs> to figure it out and I'm looking this up and then, or I scan the article and I know like the few words I'm looking for and like, okay, this page is the important page. And then I'm like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to labor with this page. So I, I mean, it would be nice if we could have that same kind of struggle at least and be able to deal with it with with Arabic but I'm a classic example my Arabic I've lived here for a thousand years and my Arabic is <laughs> garbage it is nowhere near where it should be but that's simply because it's a function of you don't have to use it right yeah right. I mean you would think though but it still falls on my shoulder where I, I need to but my Arabic is in nowhere shape or form where I could even you know I am part of the problem like mm. I, I am very much part of the problem um and and I'm mm. becoming more and more aware of this so my Arabic is not very strong. And so I, you know, I, I know that yeah. I'm not helping this situation. I am actively a problem within this situation. Um, and I think it's important to, at least to recognize that and, you know. Yeah. But it's, it is a challenge. So We weren't trying to attack you. No. It's just, but it's, inter it's really interesting. No, but it's something that I, I yeah. have to reflect because this has been something that I think as, you know, a foreign Egyptologist yeah. living in Egypt, you do I mean, in the last couple of years, I've been like, wow, where do I fit in this picture? And what am mm. I doing? Mm. And there is a colonial past. And I am a white person. I am in Egypt. I am doing Egyptology. How am I? What is the baggage I'm bringing in? Like, Egyptologists, we do have to do this reckoning. Right. And I'm, you know, we all need to do it. And it's something that I'm still, like, going through, you know? Um, so, yeah, it's a bit of a, a, a challenge. And... It also comes through, like, the other hard thing, man. Jobs. Jobs, 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 jobs. Mm -hmm. what, jobs. What, what about that? What do you mean? Well, I mean, okay. Do you mean it's harder to get jobs if you don't have language? What do you... Well, I mean, like, in the colonial sphere of all this. Yeah. Is that... So you've got the language. You've got the limited access to all the... Uh, external support that comes from being in major universities, particularly in the West, either from institutional funding, which is fewer and far between these days, but access to external grants, access to wealthy patrons that want to fund archaeology. Yeah. So that is still very much in the in in in, in the West. Um, you know, particularly Europe, they have these. You know, the state has the German Archaeological Institute, the French Archaeological Institute, that does provide funds. And those institutes, they are working more closely with Egyptian colleagues now. So that's like something that is changing positively. But, you know, getting employed in in Egyptology and making a living that can properly feed your family is like not an easy thing to do. Of course. Hmm. And you know, even me, I'm I'm. I'm teaching in, 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 in a writing program yeah. and teaching one Egyptology class as well. Like it, this Egyptology professor position is, is very difficult to find. And so, you know, there's a huge gap in terms of access to being an Egyptologist and making the money in the West, here, everywhere. It's like there's just a lot of challenges to, to, mm. doing, to doing this job. So mm. like, so basically what you're saying, I think, is that if you wanted to be an Egyptologist in the West, you can get the funding and be there. But doing it from Egypt is actually an even bigger challenge, despite the fact that you're in the place where you can actually be actively doing this work easier. Okay. You can very, very much get a job, you know, at a university or in the ministry, but high paying jobs. Oh, yeah. Mm -mm. This is a very different story. Yeah, of course. So very, like, you know, 
very high, high paying jobs. Like, you know, when I say high paying jobs, I don't even mean that high paying. I mean, like, even if you're a professor of Egyptology and you're at a major university in the West, you're not making that much money. I mean, you're, you're middle class sure. kind of thing. It's not, yeah. you know, vast sums. But there, there is a lack of a route to make a lot of money. And I see something like at the American University in Cairo, this is a major challenge because there's students that are passionate about ancient Egypt and, and you know, it's a very expensive university to go to. And if parents are, are paying for this, it's a lot of money. And there's not a lot of return on on that kind of money, you know, to, in terms of career. Yeah. There's not a lot of money you can make yeah. doing Egyptology. So parents are like, I'm not going to pay this much money for you to go to school mm-hmm. for a job that you're going to make, you know, a government salary on. Like, yeah. no. Um, so this is, it is like, these are challenging things that that are, are, are present, you know. Mm-hmm. I just think the world funds the wrong stuff. They totally do. That's like, because you're working <laughs> on like our understanding of humanity. And they're out here like funding people to do like, make like better Viagra, right? <laughs> well, but even those scientists, you know, like people do in research, all of that's good stuff. The thing that like really makes me crazy is when I find like how much an international like soccer player makes. Well, mm. that's the extreme example. I'm like, are you kidding yeah. me? Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you well, kick a ball. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, he, but he, yeah, sure. Yeah, if you're gonna yeah. talk, about, if you're gonna take it that but far, but then, yeah. but yeah. then, yeah. you know, kicking the ball gets, uh, you know, gets the yeah. gets gets to distract the masses from mm. from from other issues. So it's it's a very valuable job. It's a valuable job. There's yeah. a lot a lot of it's other. A very, it's a very powerful drug. Yeah. There's a lot of ads being sold. A lot of money is around that industry, of yeah. course. Yeah. But yeah, so I mean, I don't know. Like it's it's a very. It's a very interesting time to be in this field. It's changing. There's a lot of, of people involved. There's lots of changes, a lot of recognition of like a lot of recognition, recognition, <laughs> a lot of recognition of a colonial past and supporting more Egyptian, you know, Egyptologists to enter the field. Um, and we'll see where this goes and, and how it's going to come out. Is there any like impact of this that you're seeing already? Like... Yeah, I mean, well, you're seeing it in the in the press reports. You're and seeing how all these fines are coming. Yeah, there's, there's a lot so more fines. Because there's so many people on the ground. Yeah, yeah, because we we were never sure if this was like uh, a bias that because we're covering it, we feel like it's it's more, or has there always been a history of it? Or whether it, it was propaganda, or whether it was propaganda, and the state's like better at just promoting restore tourism somehow. Yeah, so they're just like they've always had these fines, but now mm. they're like pulling out press releases. That's, that's from really them. cool. Yeah. So, but it sounds like what you're saying is there has been an actual change, and there is. There's more labor on the ground from Egyptians who are good at their job because yeah. they've been properly trained now. And yeah. so now we're seeing the fruits of that. Yeah. That's, that's fascinating. So that's, I mean, that's part of what's coming out of this. And yeah. so that is, that is an exciting thing. From all of the things that have been found in recent years, has there been any that have been like mind blowing for you with like, since you actually have like the context for this stuff? Well, the reason, I mean, I, okay, first of all, so many of these things come out and I am not the best in the world at staying on top of all the different sites that are, you know, being found. But the one that came out recently, a few months ago, the city in Luxor. The Pompeii-like city? Was that that one? Yeah, this is the but one they, that Zahi was found. Yeah, Pompeii-like. that it was, it's, it's a city that's relatively intact. It's a settlement. Mm. Um, and that's very cool. So that's the kind of stuff that I'm like, oh my God, that's so interesting. So okay. I look forward to more information coming out about that. Okay. Are you able to like access these sites if if you wanted to as a person working in the field? If, if there's like a big discovery like that or it's... it's... No, I mean, it's all very controlled. You yeah. know, you can't just like... Show Hi, up. I'm I'm an Egyptologist <laughs> and I'm interested. I'm Meredith Brand. <laughs> I'm you Brand. might remember me from National Geographic and then move out the way. <laughs> move, move, move. I've come with a trowel. No, like that's not, uh, you can't just like walk up there. I mean, um, you know, if I know an inspector working at a site, okay. maybe I could ask for a tour and they'd have to like get it approved and stuff. But like, I mean, yeah. you know, you can't just like okay. walk up and be like, hey, what's up? I'm Meredith. Let me come and take a look. Mm. Um, so that's, no, it's it's all. That's disappointing. I was, hoping, I was hoping that was your life. I, I, like, would, I wish that was my life. Pulling up like, ah, oh, I got to get to Luxor tomorrow. Yeah. What's the hat? <laughs> yeah, no, if I was like checking the news in the morning with my coffee, I'd be like, oh, off to Sa'ara. Like, yeah. can I go look at this site? Yeah. But no, that is that is not <laughs> what happens. Is Egypt normal in that regard? Like, is it is it is Egypt quite restrictive in, in allowing people access to the sites, even like professionals? Or is, that, or is it kind of standard? Well, I mean, like, I think everywhere in the world, you know, an active excavation, there's limited access, you know, yeah. because they are actively digging. They're pulling stuff up out of the ground. It's a security issue. You can't just have people, like, wandering up sure. to to an active dig as they please. Um, 
so I mean that's like everywhere would would want to control that sure. to some to some degree. Sure. I mean you do you know you, you like if if for example if a site is being excavated in in Luxor or something at the Valley of the you know, there's constant work at the Valley of the Kings happening. They're still doing their work and tourists are coming by and they're watching and going okay. okay, okay. Um, and then they move along. They can't like go in it, but they can see it. Oh. So it depends on where the excavation is happening. If it's okay. by a tourist site, then of course people can go and like have a little yeah. looky loo and oh, what's going on. Um, so of course that's that's possible. No, but I, I remember guess. a few years ago when they uh, when they dug something up uh, a pharaoh a pharaoh head uh, in the and middle Matareya. of Matareya, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and there were there were, the pictures were so funny. There were you know there were just pictures of like kids running around like until the i guess the, the the you know the guys like you know who deal with that kind of thing got there and at some point they put a, a like a like a spider-man, spider-man blanket, blanket on it to like yeah. protect it from the kids like jumping on it and shit it was so funny yeah i'll show you the pictures it's it's, it's hilarious <laughs> it's like the, the you know the egyptians way of being like we'll take care of it like you know spider-man blanket <laughs> you use what you got i mean at the end of the day like you know you, you people use every kind of thing you can possibly yeah. find because you know you don't think you're going to necessarily find a giant statue and you don't necessarily have a piece of cloth that can cover it so you gotta be like Who's got a blanket? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. to figure to figure it out. Yeah, I just think it's cool people keep finding this stuff all over Egypt. Mm. Like you know, there's I, tons of stuff. Yeah, like I I didn't I didn't appreciate how much stuff is still all under the ground. That's like a stupid statement, but I no no. But me me too. Yeah, me neither. I didn't, I didn't realize I had no idea. until we started finding these. Until stories. they started yeah. like really promoting it, and I'm like, wait, they're still finding stuff, and it's like, yeah, yeah they are all the I don't time. I don't think the average person <laughs> who doesn't who, who really doesn't follow stuff like is that aware of the the level of like activity and the level of things that still just need to be found oh know? dude i mean like the sheer volume yeah. of stuff that comes from ancient egypt so okay in 2011 uh when i was doing my phd we were excavating at abydos this is near soheg and it's like a huge uh site for the god of the underworld osiris it was believed to be his 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 burial and the entrance to the underworld and there were a huge pilgrimage and there's so we were in north abydos with university of toronto excavation with my advisor marianne pools wagner okay. and we had four squares that were opened up that were five by five me five by five meter squares took out over a hundred thousand pieces of pottery a hundred thousand pieces oh wow and those five by five i mean like you know did a lot of stuff like this is you know part of archaeology one of the big challenges is like how do you analyze and process and study the sheer amount of things mm. that come out of ground like the statues get the big attention but i mean so i'm, I'm a ceramicist i do pottery and like vast quantities i mean people that do the animal bones i mean we're talking tens of thousands of animal bones that come out from you know excavations mm. like there is just so much stuff do you have like a favorite thing you've ever found or been part of finding or anything like that yes okay <laughs> it was from that same excavation um so this is outside of uh, a temple of a new kingdom king so similar like you know 1300s bc um and there was a a, like a burial from a later time period. Okay. And it was on top of the, the stuff that they were trying to get to. So they excavated this burial and there was, again, faience, that blue-green color, a pot, and they brought it back and inside there was incense, cedar incense, mm. and it still smelled. Wow. I was able to smell a perfume that was from like 800 BC. Oh, wow. How did it smell? It was <laughs> very cedar. It kind of smelled like, you know, the little, like, triangled, like, the little tree air fresheners? Kind of smelled like that. Okay. Oh, <laughs> it, did, wow. it didn't smell that. I mean, maybe it was, like, affected by time. <laughs> but it was, like, a super cedar wood smell. Mm, it was wow. really cool. Like, to have, like, a sensory experience yeah. that somebody from that long ago would have had. That Someone was, like, my favorite. You guys had shared the same smell as someone yeah. from... How long, what year would that have been? Like, how long old was that? That's that was probably from 800 BC. 800 BC. Okay. Yeah. How how accurate are these dating techniques? Is another thing oh, I've Lord. always wondered. Uh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Is that a, that's a big Ooh. topic, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Can, are, I, like, can I actually, like, back that up with, like, a little preface for why I even asked that? And you could, like, throw, you could, like, run out after I ask this question if, if you think it's too annoying. Um, there's this guy you've probably heard of, I don't know, maybe this geologist named Robert Schock. And he had this theory about the Sphinx based on the water markings, that it was much oh. older then the kind of classic mm-hmm. narrative would say, based on, I think the narrative that mainstream Egyptology, Zahi Huas and them have constructed, his argument is it's thousands of years older because there's watermarks, so there has clearly been flooding, and there hasn't been flooding in this part of the world, except since, I don't know, 11,000 BC or something like that. How, how Are these debates still live, or have they been crushed? And like, this is not a question. Yeah. I mean, that has been crushed. Okay. Um, but 
dating archaeological sites is this is like the one thing that archaeologists will be at a conference and like throw shoes at each other about. Like it's like a very okay. contentious. That's what it sounded like when he was speaking. It sounded like issue. this was a huge debate. It's it's a huge debate, and part of the challenge is that Egypt is. The chronology, the, the the time period of Egypt, is a cornerstone for understanding the chronology of other parts of the Levant. Hmm. So that have less well-dated textual records. So like the archaeology of like Palestine and Lebanon and parts of Syria, like they they really and they really like link things to Egypt because they can find like Egyptian artifacts. And so a lot of people in the the Near Eastern archaeological region are very much invested in like getting the Egyptian chronology strong. So there's a lot of challenges to this. I mean, one of them is that, like, the scientific dating techniques, like radiocarbon dating, they're pretty good, but they are not incredibly precise. It's like plus or minus 50 years, okay. which... But that's still quite accurate. It's still quite accurate, but then you have readings that can come from different sites and different things. So when you have multiple different readings from different labs, from different types of material that all have plus or minus, I don't know what, yeah. it, it becomes very fuzzy. So then, you know, you have the names of the king and you have their, their the years that they reigned and then you have astronomical observations that we can kind of date. So you've got some anchor points okay. every like, you know, 500,000 years. They'll say this star rose and okay, that had to have been at this one specific time so they can anchor that. And trying to connect all of it together um, is very challenging. And then, you know, you, pottery is another major important part of this because pottery styles changed very fast. Pottery is indestructible. And so you find it at all the levels. So they want to connect a pottery style to a date so they can date the appearance of that pottery elsewhere. So it's like a huge thing. Okay. I mean, it's a very controversial issue. Okay. But is there still any controversy over major sites like the pyramids and the Sphinx and things like that? No, I mean, not not in, I mean, w they argue, when I mean, we're talking like the major actual academic b debates are like over 100 years or something like that. It's not like massive. Okay. It's it's minute. People are really into it and it's very specific. Um, the stuff with the pyramids, I mean, this is like a whole nother set of things. And, you know, the pyramids, it becomes much more complicated because there's a lot of people that are outside of traditional Egyptology that have various beliefs about yeah. them that mm -hmm. make it far more, you know, complicated. That's like a whole nother, you know, that's like a whole... I thought world. it was fascinating, but I have no way to evaluate it, obviously, as a regular <laughs> person. So mm. how, how did they crush his theory? Do you, or is this just I, way beyond what you... It had? is not like okay. a thing that I am okay. so fascinated in. Okay. <laughs> so I wouldn't... I just one of those things I'm like, what? <laughs> Uh, mm. To you, it probably makes no sense, right? Well, I mean, I like, you know, we, I, there's a settlement of the guys who built the pyramids. It's right there and everything is nicely dated and there's, you know, okay. the names are on the pyramid. Okay. So, the, the, so, the, so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, so you you know you know about how some people argue that uh, the pyramids are, real, are really solar plants and all that. They, they're not solar plants, are they? I mean, no, no they're like, they? when when you watch like when you watch when you hear people like bring up these theories of like there was extraterrestrial intervention, yeah. like yeah. does that well, as, you, as an archaeologist that? does that just drive you mad or like how do you or do you say like well there are mysteries of it and we don't actually understand all of it like how do you evaluate those kind of things? Well, I mean, okay, so like I think it's important when you do archaeology to kind of like take a step back and realize that okay. I have something from a very specific scholarly perspective, but one of the reasons why I'm even sitting here talking to you is because people care about Egyptology yeah. that's not just, you know, Egyptologist. And so understanding what Egyptology means, what the pyramids mean to different people and why in, is in itself very fascinating. Yeah. Like, so that's something that I'm just like, you know, if, if I meet like a, an alien kind of person, like an ancient aliens, like blah, 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 I'm like... Okay, but tell me why. Like, I want to know, like, why you think this, like, what does it mean to you? Like, I would want to know, like, if I was talking to someone, like, what does it mean to you that the aliens built this? Like, why, what's that connection there? Like, you know, when you have so much evidence of humans doing it, what, what's making you think, it must yeah. be the aliens. Like, I'm, I'm curious to know, like, what that, what that is, mindset. What, what is the answer usually? I, I, I don't, okay, this is, this is actually a very bad thing, but when I, socialize with people like in you know okay when i'm going to parties here in cairo like i really don't come across people that talk about the alien thing no i and haven't either i did one time 
<laughs> I was I was in um, I was in Stella Bar, and I was meeting with some friends. And this this older guy came and joined him joined us, and he was part of the like a, a broader friend group. And he was a big aliens built the pyramid. So I was like, okay, so I'm just curious. Take me through the way you think this happened. And he said, okay, he thinks that there were ancient Egyptians, and then the aliens came. And they used their like tractor beams or whatever, and they made the pyramids. And I was like, okay, but what did Egyptians do? He was like, well, they stood around and <laughs> clapped. I'm like, what are you like? How is that a possible? Th-? And I was just like asking him more questions to like understand his theory because I'm like, I don't understand. So I just I'm like, this is like an older, an older kind of more upper class, you know, downtown Cairo gentleman, you mm-hmm. know. And I was like, how? I, I, I was just so fascinated and I just mm. kind of want to more hear him talk because mm. like, what can I say that's going to like change anything? Well, you're the authority. You could say a lot. No, but like at that point, it's a belief. And mm. I'm like... Because, yeah, because you've probably heard of ancient aliens, right? Yes. Have you ever... Do, do you watch it? Like, Did you watch the, the one on ancient Egypt or any of the... It's, no, it's, 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 it's good entertainment. They, 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 they give no evidence whatsoever. We, I mean, we, we have we, noticed. Well, they're, they're really entertaining. Yeah, they're They don't just do ancient <laughs> Egypt. They do Cause, cause, all cause, kind of places. Uh, they and have, they link everything to aliens. Every human accomplishment funny. that you can't yeah. really quite... It's like difficult to explain because of the difficulty of whatever it was. It's like, well, we're not quite sure about this, therefore, Aliens. But maybe exactly. But but maybe aliens. It's yeah. like this. Yeah. But maybe aliens. But they never provide. But they actually any don't evidence. provide evidence. So, yeah. So you're left like, interesting theory, man. <laughs> but like, <laughs> I know it's it's the most fascinating thing, and I'm like. But well, I can see people watching it and just thinking, oh. Then. But yeah. so, so that's why I was wondering your perspective yeah. as someone who actually I mean, knows. Like, it's just it's the, for me it's confusing because like you know. But are there but aliens or not? I mean, are there aren't are there still like mysteries surrounding how the pyramids? Were I mean, built? there is a lot of debates about you know the ramps and things that they used to move the stones and the exact construction Cause, techniques. Because like there the, is debate surrounding that yeah. part like actual like scholarly academic debate there's debate surrounding that yeah. that part for sure yeah um mm. you know like did the ramps what, go around or did it go like this or you know mm. that's probably what provides the opening like for people saying it it sounds like what they're saying is like we have no idea because you know you hear this line a lot like people still have no idea how people built the pyramids is that just not true i mean that's for a large part not true because i mean there has been they have just been so extensively studied and yeah. you know we know how, like, there's a solid understanding of the entire administration and economy around it because there's a settlement, Hetel Rorob, that's, like, right next to the, the pyramids where it's the workman's village. I mean, you have the entire administrative support for the building of the pyramids. You find the ropes around the pyramids. You find, like, they found so many other construction kind of materials. And inside the pyramids, there's uh, graffiti from the workmen okay. with, like, their team name and then the name of Khufu, for example. You know, there's a lot of... Graffiti inscriptions that, that kind of, you know, indicate that it's people and it's, you know, mm-hmm. for Hufu, the pharaoh, and this is what happened. So, I mean, there's just like a lot of evidence that supports that. People built it. It was the humans. It's just mm-hmm. we don't have the exact construction techniques down. And there's, you know, debates about, but that's, the, I mean, even if you have a lot of evidence, like, I mean, not to get too abstract, but like, what is fact? Like, you know, I mean, yeah. you, you like... Hmm. Even if I look at an archaeological site and there's, you know, an extensive amount of archaeological materials and we find some bits of ancient text that elaborate more and we have the names and the titles and the dates and we have a lot of things, there's still an amount of interpretation that goes on, you know, at these at these sites. So there will always be debates. There will always be things that are uncertain. And even if you look at history from, you know, if you have a very well-known, if you're doing modern history or something and you're talking about the Cold War or whatever, yeah. there's still debates when you have literally all the evidence right yeah, there yeah and there's still debates within these fields and that that is part of scholarship and it's part of what makes it so much fun mm-hmm. um is because you will have different ways of looking at it yeah i like mm-hmm. the mystery of it i think it makes it interesting yeah i mean yeah. i like i would hate to time travel back to ancient egypt hate oh it would be the worst because then i would what? know the answer no and then how boring I, would that I, be i want to know no i really want to that's know. half the fun it's, is doing the figuring out and not knowing and coming up with theories and then reading other people's theories and then looking at the archaeological site again and trying to figure it out like what's the point of doing what i do if i like i mean time travel would be the worst oh i'd hate to go back to it would be bad for your profession mm. oh it'd yeah. be terrible but but you could still like go back and write a book about it but no i mean well i mean if i time traveled i mean <laughs> it would be a big thing like i think i'd leave archaeology altogether and have a whole new field of life for sure but like i don't i like having it be unknown that's that's the point 
Yeah. Like, what, then what's like your favorite mystery of like it all or if you, that, that, that keeps you kind of going? My favorite mystery. I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't like. I maybe the, didn't formulate that right, but the, you know. I don't, the, you know, the, the, like cause it, cause, mystery. Cause mm. Mystery is not a great mm. word. It's just, we can be, but, but like, you know. Unknown. The, I mean, I, I really want to know how people made ends meet in ancient Egypt. How did people make a living? How do they live? Like, that's something that I'm really very curious about. You know, how much, like, I would like to know, like, how much actual, how did they manage poverty? How did they manage, like, these kind of social challenges and economic challenges that we have not figured out in our society? Like, how did they, how did they deal with that? Yeah. I'm, like, really curious. I would really like to know about that. Because mm-hmm. I do, I do think that there is this kind of nostalgia that people have like, I mean, this is just my impression being here in Egypt. There's nostalgia for several periods of time. There's certainly a nostalgia for, like, you know, the 1920s to the 1950s. Yeah. And I certainly, you know, I've noticed it. Like, the amount of students yeah. that I'm teaching at AUC, their name, like, Farouk and Farida and things like that. There's a nostalgia for that period of time. Then there's, you know, I think a nostalgia about, you know, some of, I don't know, Mamluk, maybe, I don't know, era yeah. in Islamic Cairo. And then there is nostalgia about ancient Egypt where people think that it was this kind of golden era, grand civilization, everything was amazing. Um, and like, I don't think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> the people I, just kind of live in poverty and I mean, enslaved I, and it was pretty bad. I mean, yeah, I like, in, I mean, slave, that's a, slave I mean, is a big question, right? That's a big, I mean, like. I thought that was for sure. Well, we were just told that slavery was, uh, was, was a big thing in ancient Egypt. Yeah, I mean, definitely, definitely, there were people that were unpaid labor, mm. you know, but I mean, it's, it's different. It, it, yeah, there was definitely unpaid slavery kind of labor, um, but it was more smaller scale. Mm. Like mostly, if you had a big, it, so it seems like this is something that I would love to know more about, and that's like where like questions that I'm really fascinated about. Like, okay, so you had a big parcel of land, and you were kind of wealthy, and you had this land, and you know, you wanted to farm it and get the produce from it. And you had some other kind of side businesses where you were manufacturing some goods. Maybe you made some wine, maybe you made some pottery, maybe you made some jewelry, whatever. You had some factories, you had some things. And you wouldn't have slaves really farming that land. You would have tenant farmers kind of thing. Seems to be more the vibe. Um. And then you'd have a couple unpaid slaves that did more like household work or the difficult things, you know, like... I mean, the, the, the process of getting water or having flour, like grinding grain, like these kind of things, it was more for, for that kind of stuff. Okay. Mm-hmm. Which, that's what we seem to think, but, you know. It, mm-hmm. um, so it, it definitely existed. Um, but yeah, like how did people deal with these challenges? And I think that's something that, you know, these are the questions that we're struggling with. And, and, and I think that if like an understanding of the past can help us understand the future, we need to understand how social challenges were met in a real way because that tells us about who we are like are we i mean this is one of the interesting things about like the ancient egyptian economy have we you know we think of the economy as like rational economic actors and things like that um one of the central debates were were, is this kind of making profit self-interest rational economic action was that something that has been there forever is that innate Mm. to human beings or is our our economy our or our, are our economy social? Are we inherently connected? What drives us? Is it shared community? Is it selfishness? Like things like that I find like really fascinating. Yeah. And that's the kind of stuff that I think, yeah, would be like cool to know about ancient Egypt and other places too. Because, yeah, that's something that I think we all struggle with in our, in our current society. And so mm-hmm. far is your work leading you to believe that this was the origins? Like humanity has always been this exploitative capitalist type system mm. or is your work mm. leaning you towards mm. the theory that maybe there's mm. elements of like mm-hmm. socialism and like the common good sort of in these older societies i mean i think so so far from what i'm i'm fine so for like if i look at my, my dissertation looked at how pots were produced for the official state temple how beer jars were produced for the official state temple and how beer jars and these tiny little votive dishes that were used to burn incense for like a public festival for the god Osiris. How how 
how they were produced in different ways. And it was really bizarre. So I entered it thinking, you know, obviously like the pharaonic state must have been the king was powerful and there must have been, you know, big factories that the king controlled everything. And then when it comes to the private festival, this is where you would see maybe more cooperation and coordination amongst people and more shared whatever. It was the opposite. Hmm. The the pots that were produced for the public festival without really direct state supervision were so uniform. They were so homogenous. I did a bunch of statistics. I measured variability of the pots in terms of their shape, and I did a bunch of statistical measurements. And these are some of the most uniform pots ever measured. Mm-hmm. I mean, equivalent to like the Roman era. And so it seems that like, you know, for the personal festivals, they actually went with the larger scale factory organization, mm-hmm. which has a whole bunch of different ideas about labor. That's where it's less socially connected, probably less, um, more maybe wage-based, less you know, connected. Whereas for the state, these pots were all over the place. I mean, they were highly variable. So it seems like there were lots of small potters that were able to maintain their own individual, like, economic activity. And they were connected to the state through just giving a little bit of pots every year that mm-hmm. they, they owed. So they the state wasn't demanding much from them. They were demanding something. And then they were connecting each other with other markets. So it seems like it's this combination of both some self-interest and some, you know, what we would think of as like, because the most logical thing to do if you're a business person is you say you build a big factory, of course, that's the most efficient thing. So it seems that efficiency did exist. And there was an idea of trying to make the most out of what you had. Mm. But when it came to the state, they were actually seemed to be more concerned with whatever helped people locally on the ground and more of the social connections. Which was very opposite of what you would expect. Hmm. Um, So I think that was a struggle, you know, that people in ancient Egypt must have had. They must have had, you know, okay, how do we, how do we get by? How do we take care of our own? But we're part of a community and how does that work? And then we're also like beholden to the state. Like how does this, like that must have been a very economic pressure. So like this is something that we all still have. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Did it make you hopeful for humanity <laughs> when you're <laughs> when you're seeing that there were states organizing people this way or the opposite because people mm. left to their own devices would still kind of like coalesce around like single capitalist projects where someone was obviously controlling all the means and then forcing everyone to do stuff it's almost like that's just how we end up organizing ourselves it kind of made me hopeful because the biggest projects were done with the most social cohesion okay. and the most sharing and cooperation And it wasn't, like, it's nice to know that a state can function and allow for people to have their own kind of networks, their own connections, their own way of doing things, and take a little bit, but leave people to kind of do their own thing. So it actually made me kind of look at the ancient Egyptian state as like, oh, they weren't like these, like, I am Pharaoh, (laughs) you know, top-down control. I was like, oh, okay, well, that's... That changed a little bit my perspective. Mm, That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That is very interesting. Mm. I wanted to ask you about the mummy parade, but not just that. Like, I, I <laughs> <laughs> um, do you agree or do you notice any kind of like Egypt, like pharaonic culture becoming used by the state or trendy socially in the last few years? Because I mean, like, mm-hmm. for example, not just the parade, like the in the capital, like the presidential palace, I think has like a lot of like pharaonic oh, it does. Mm. features. I haven't seen it. Um just but but you you've been you've been looking at this for so long. I feel like you would see the trajectory of how like Egypt uses its pharaonic past. So how are they using it like now compared to past eras? Is mm. it like do you see anything interesting happening now with that? Because the parade was yeah. like such a big deal. And I think that new uh, well the, the the new museum they opened up that's too, as well. That's the Grand Egyptian Museum, yeah. the National Museum of yeah. Egyptian yeah. Civilization. Yeah. yeah, those are two that have opened up. I mean, I find it very fascinating. Just if you look at the last you know the trajectory of kind of modern Egyptian history. When there's moments of big change in Egypt, there is a looking back towards the pharaonic period. Like, you know, it, it happened to coincide with the 1919 revolution and uh. with, you know, the founding of Tut was 1922, which made a big, you know, ancient Egypt mania anyways around the world. Yeah. And then, you know, in, in the, the kind of push for an independent civilization, uh, sorry, for an independent state, uh, independent from Br- British colonialism, there was a degree of having art, like the famous statue right in front of Cairo University from the 30s. Um, you know, a lot of this kind of public art had ancient Egyptian undertones. There was a bringing in of ancient Egypt into 
sort of modern Egyptian popular culture. And that was part of this big shift to say we are Egyptians and have had this like very long civilization. So why is Britain here controlling us? Excuse me. Um, so that that was a big part then. Hmm. And I think it's really interesting that Egypt is facing another set of changes, another set of challenges, and reclaiming a sense of national pride. And Egyptology and like ancient Egyptian themes is once again kind of coming up. Um I, you know, and I think that that's, it makes sense. I mean, yeah. it is certainly something to be proud of. Uh, and I think that, you know, it would make sense that that, that it would come out again as, as a point of, of, of pride. But as, a, as an Egyptologist, how, how connected do you feel modern Egyptians are really to ancient Egyptians? Either in yeah. terms of like DNA or culture. <laughs> I feel like... I am not the person to, as an Egyptologist, yeah. I wouldn't know this because like we said earlier in the conversation, it's a mm. colonial field. So like, I mean, there's only a limit to what I can, you know, say about like Egyptian and people and what, what people feel and think here. Um, but I, well, at least the cultural part, because you're, you're, because st- when you were, when you were describing how you're interested in these uh, cities that they, that they, you know, that they find and the comparison between them and the, the, you know, the more rich neighborhoods, I guess, of the past. It's, it's, it's quite similar to what we have today. You know, the compounds, the, you know, the yeah. compounds, uh, the rich compounds we have in Egypt are, are very, are very, very organized. Yeah. If you look at them from above, they're, you know, they have some kind of shape. Yeah. But then you go to the, to the, you know, to the, to the, you know, less privileged areas and they're just all over the place. And yeah. you, you wonder, you, you're like, did no one like try to even plan this place? Like what happened? Yeah. So, so I mean, the, I don't know. It just, it makes me wonder whether there is some kind of uh, a connection between the, the, the two somehow. Well, I think, okay. So there's been like a lot of, so Faiza Heikel at AUC, who's now, you know, since since retired, but she spearheaded a lot of research into this, a lot of cultural connections between ancient Egypt that survived in the Coptic period and moved on to the modern period uh, in terms of food or expressions or language or things like this. And there is, you know, a lot of stuff that has crossed over and there is definitely a connection. And I think, I think this is a period of you know, nationalism in, in Egypt. And I do think more and more people have a connection to it. And I think that when you consider what ancient Egypt means to people, I mean, ancient Egypt means a lot to different groups of people. You know, there's, um, yeah. it means, it means, I think a lot to, to, to modern Egyptians, um, that is a cultural connection and it's even outside of DNA. Like that's something that's, you know, there's not much, there's, there are very few DNA studies uh, from ancient Egyptian material, like ancient DNA studies. Um, and I, I don't think that this even, whatever ancient DNA would reveal, I don't think that's going to make a difference to people in, in modern Egypt as to the connection, because it is cultural and it is a deeper connection than, than what DNA could provide an answer for. Um, likewise, you know, ancient Egypt means a lot to African diaspora populations too. Um, you know, there's an incredible connection that, that people feel to, to ancient Egypt. And then, you know, ancient Egypt has a meaning for, for, you know, Western, like white European and American people. Um, and it's very popular in Japan. Um, you know, I think, oh, yeah. so there's like, <laughs> yeah, what is <laughs> yes. Okay. So yeah, you grew up in Japan. Partly, yeah. Yes. Did you, did but you they, see a lot of the like ancient Egypt stuff in Japan when you were there? Uh, not that, but they 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 would all get really excited. Then they'd go, ah, pyramid soup. <laughs> wait, wait, I I don't know anything about this. So why is that? What is the connection between they're Japan just, and? They're just obsessed. Is there a? It's no, just it's, like I think other, it's the same way. Like I think I think I think a lot of Americans grew up obsessed yeah. with uh, yeah. you know or like into it. Like they you, you know yeah. you have to study some of it. I think at least yeah. in, in school and things like that. Okay. Well, this is so, also part of the kind of you know lingering of the colonial in the field is that you don't bat an eyelid at all if like an American like wants to study the archaeology of Peru you're like well of course but if you know a Japanese person wanted to study yeah. the archaeology of Peru we're like well why would they want to do that yeah, you know it's just like right. inherent I just walked into that trap yeah. feeling <laughs> no but I mean it it it, it makes sense yeah. and then you know like I mean I I think I'm you know 
I myself have had, you know, as it will have similar, you know, questions to this. Mm. You know, I'll be like, oh, well, how did that happen? How, why is this person? And I'm like, oh, wait a second. And I'll have to be like, hmm. Mm. Um, and so, you know, yeah. I, I think it would be exciting to get to the day of scholarship where you have, you know, archaeologists from around, you know, you have Egyptian archaeologists going to excavate uh, Iron Age settlements from from the UK. Mm. Like, that would be really cool. Speaking of the UK and Europe in general, um, uh, we, we've 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 noticed that uh, Egypt Egypt has been trying to you know uh, you know take back some of the you know of, yeah. the, of the artifacts and all that. How how has that been successful? What do what do you what, what do you think of that? Yeah. What's going on with that? Just... I mean, I that I mean, do you, do what do you think? The British Museum. I I I think the right thing for them to do would be to give these artifacts back. How do they justify still having that stuff? Excuse me, um, that's probably an incredibly ignorant question. No, 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 it's not an ignorant question. No, but it's I, I, a I very just important don't one. It. Mm. So the I think their fundamental argument is that there's such thing as cultural, global cultural heritage that we all have a shared cultural heritage. So it should be for everyone to enjoy and experience right. all around the globe, uh, which I agree with. The problem is the execution of this idea is inherently, you know, colonial. That, you know, people in, in, in the UK or New York or Paris or wherever, they can go to a museum and they can have a full global narrative and they can see material from China, from Mexico. They can see ancient Egypt. They can see everything. Right. Um, but if you're from Egypt, where's your, you know, global <laughs> museum where you have material culture from everywhere? You know, so it's a very one-sided uh, activity and practice. Mm. So... I mean, I think the, the the British Museum they it would just behoove them because most of these artifacts were taken under really horrible circumstances. You know, either yeah. outright theft or subterfuge, or were part of you know colonial mess. And I think it would greatly be the right thing to do to return them. Um, and if I could like wave a magic wand and like mm -hmm. have a solution that I think would be amazing. What I, in Meredith's fantasy world, would love to have mm -hmm. is that also the British Museum, the Met, the Louvre, the everywhere, they have tons of artifacts in storage. So what they should do is for every kind of major capital where they have lots of artifacts from, they should send a lot of their stuff in storage and make up broad perspective museums. Like there should be a museum in Cairo that's got material from the Met and from the British Museum and from all these museums around the world. So there's you know, kids growing up in Egypt could go look at ancient Chinese ceramics. They could go look at Mayan art. And then to have study, like, programs for promoting the scholarship of them. So students could go to Cairo University and they could study Aztec archaeology and then go on an excavation to Mexico and dig there and, you know, have their own collection in Egypt of, you know, Mexican artifacts and study that. And likewise, in Mexico, there might be a project in China that they're doing and they have their own global museum. So if that's the argument that they want to keep and perpetuate, then mm. they need to make sure that everyone has access to that kind of shared mm. global heritage and everyone has access to the knowledge and the ability and the right to study and to participate in field work all around the world, just like people in, in the West do. And so that would be like an ideal solution. Never going to happen. Um, I, I think one of the arguments is that, um, I don't know how to say this very diplomatically, but is that just, Egypt doesn't really take care of its things, basically. So ha have we gotten better in any sort of way at, at, yeah. at preserving our, our ancient treasures? Well, I mean, that's rich for many people in, in Europe to say. I mean, because World War II destroyed so many... Mm. artifacts i mean museums got blown up cultural mm. heritage i mean i don't you know. even know if, if, you, if europeans say that it just, so they do they do say it no, no this, oh, okay. is, this is this, this is, is an argument we used to hear I mean, but like i wonder yeah. like in 2021 do we still hear that argument this is making fun of themselves almost yeah so i mean this is definitely like i think this is this has been actively said for sure in in the in the argument and i think it's it's heavily implied now and i think that you know egypt has now gone above and beyond with uh, conservation training and storage and these facilities are amazing. And, you know, Egypt is really asking for like five key pieces to come back. You know, they want like major stuff. The Rosetta Stone, the Zodiac of Dendera that was like literally cut from the roof of the temple in when, Dendera. When was that taken? In the 1800s. This French dude French. just like cut out this amazing French relief. People. So that's in the Louvre now? Yeah. And mm -hmm. took it and brought it there okay. so i mean this is like a physically a part of the building like obviously that should come back it's what just it's the same thing with the parthenon marbles like you know 
Okay. That's like part of the yeah. building that was destroyed. Lord Elgin oh, took them down, destroyed them. And, you know, that should obviously go back. Like yeah. it's it's active destruction of the building to remove it. Um, so, you know, these Wait, things... hold on. Are, what are the other three? I'm sorry. Did, are they, there's really five specific ones? Not to those, are, those are the five big ones that they okay. want back. The Zahi was, Zahi was, was arguing back. So it's the Bust of Nefertiti. Okay. In, in Berlin. Okay. Uh, Rosetta Stone okay, in London. A, seems like a big one. Uh, yeah. Uh, Zodiac okay. of Dendera in the Louvre. And then I think there's the Bust of Ankhof. Okay. It's a statue in the Boston Museum. And there's one more. It's Okay. Okay. I can't remember which one it is. But these, I mean, these, certainly these artifacts, I mean, it's like the so most the, insulting the, the, thing. The, the, the U.S., the U.K., and France, basically. Yeah. The, 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 bigger, the, bigger, the biggest. In Germany. Uh, past colonial yeah. powers. And, yeah, in Germany. So, yeah. of course, they should give them back. And, yeah, that's the implication that, like, Egypt can't, can't take care of their stuff, which but is like. It sounds like the argument, that argument from what you're saying and, and the work you do, that, that doesn't have legs to stand on anymore. It has no legs to stand on. And it Yay. probably hasn't for, it hasn't for a long time, I'm guessing. I mean. <laughs> It hasn't had any legs to stand Did on. Did it ever? I mean, there's not a single place in the world that can really 100% guarantee the safety of everything. Okay. Mm. Like, you know, there always could be something that happens. There could be some kind of ingenious, you know, theft. Yeah. Or like in the case of Europe during World War II, there could be war. So it's essentially just you a know? racist argument. And it it, yes, was. yes. Yeah. It's essentially mm-hmm. a racist argument. Yeah. And so that's, I mean, yes, Egypt very much can take care of these, these yeah. artifacts. The, I know these are kind of like naive questions almost, no, but, but it's like I'm interested to hear you like mm, actually no, it's, it's something, how, how, you, how people in your field talk about it. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's something that, that, that many, many, it's still very much there in the minds yeah. of some of these museums and, and from, you know, certain people in Europe and North America. And and I think it is important to say that, yeah, Egypt can take care of it. <laughs> mm. Like, I mean, this has been, I think, part of the promotion too of the Grand Egyptian Museum and the National Museum of Egyptian Civilization is these like incredible conservation labs that are like amazing. And there's, I mean, Egypt has put, so, the Ministry of Antiquities has put in, well, now it's the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities, has put so much work into training conservation. So conservation, like that is doing really well here. Hmm. Um, so it's Good. fine. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's, yeah. That's yeah, I mean, at the, at the I mean, we, 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 you know, you when you live in Egypt, you rarely hear anything, uh, you know, quite positive. That's why, that's why it's like, you know, you're always just kind of asking these questions where it's like, is it, is it true? Like, because you start believing it, you know? Yeah. So. Or it's yeah. hard. It's, so it's hard good, to it's know. Good to hear that. It's hard to know exactly where the truth lies. <laughs> yeah. And but, yeah, but and at I mean, the point where they're building this massive immaculate museum, it's hard to justify keeping their pieces in these Western, these Western mm-hmm. institutions. Like, like the gem looks quite incredible. Yeah. So. How, no, it, how do you how do you justify keeping their stuff away from this beautiful thing that they've built here for this purpose? I mean, it's that, yeah, hmm. their it, arguments are getting simply. yeah their their arguments are not strong at all. And I mean, this is something that I I think you know a lot of but a lot of museums and are, are having to to come to terms with this. I mean, because you have even a lot of you know sub-Saharan African material like from Benin, the bronzes that were like straight up robbed. Yeah. You know, and there are people with living cultural memory of these artifacts. They're like, a hello. They, they're very upset and they, they want them back. And I think museums are, are there needs to be, rec- you know, some kind of reckoning. And, and, it, and it's starting to happen. And it needs to continue. Like, but I Is mean, it starting to happen in Egypt as well? With Egypt, with Egyptian pieces? Um, less so. So, I mean, it depends. Like, there are stuff that has been voluntarily returned. Okay. Um, like the insane story of the Ramses the First Mummy. From this museum in Niagara. Okay. Um, this mummy's had a roundabout crazy history. In the early 2000s, this this mummy was found in a museum in Niagara. Like, and it looked royal. Like, I mean, it had like the arms was crossed. It looked royal, okay. and the people looked at it and they're like, "Oh my goodness, this is you know." Um, this shouldn't be here. What? <laughs> How? How? <laughs> what? Yeah. And so that was, you know, the Michael C. Carlos Museum in Atlanta got involved and then they donated it and they brought it back to Egypt. Okay. So, I mean, there are definitely okay. people that are making good decisions. Okay. And that has happened. But, like, there's, like, a lot of, you know, like, <laughs> just... <laughs> Stuff out there, stuff out there, and people that are <laughs> like Egypt's shit is all over the place. They were, they were, yeah, yeah, I think because I think something else was returned a few years ago. I remember yeah. having to cover it. Yeah, yeah, maybe so an obelisk or something. Things yeah. are being returned, yeah. but I mean, you look at obelisks are all over cities in Europe, and yeah. I mean, like isn't there in America, one in Washington D.C., yeah, yeah and New York City, right? There's one in New York in Central uh, Park. There, I think I so. I think that's right. Yeah. I should know that. I, sh- I, I should know this. <laughs> I'm the one who should know this. And I'm like, oh, I think there's some in New York. I mean, there's, there's, there's these things. 
everywhere. And this is part of that kind of like sigh when you think about Egyptology. And I just kind of go, you know, I, it's just so steeped in a very difficult past. And it's like really hard to know how to proceed and where to go and, yeah. and feasibly what can be done. And it's like important to talk about it and to think about it and consider it. But I mean, what, 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 what are we going to do? <laughs> what are we going to do? Um, hmm. It's a challenge, man. I don't know. (laughs) Like, I just raise issues and say, well, maybe you should have a global museum for everybody. Like, and and it's soup, like, like a Disney world, kind of like a Disney, like, (laughs) bippity boppity boop, like a wave, you know, a wave a wand kind of answer. But that can't, you know, that's not feasible. Maybe one day. I don't know. But at least start by giving back stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's not a, that's not a big ask. You're you're naming five tangible things that they've asked to be given back that were clearly stolen. It's not, we're Mm. we're living like, we're, we're, if you're, if you're, you know. Yeah. And that, that, it just seems a bit like out of step, like in, at this current time where we're all aware of these issues to still be holding on to this stuff. Yeah. It seems like in this particular field, this, it's a bit, we're, it's, yeah, it's a bit it, retrograde in some way. Yeah. yeah, this is not this. This is this is the kind of no brainer one, yeah. which is like, yeah, just give them back. Mm-hmm. But then you know, all the they're Egyptian like, but artifacts. They're so pretty. We yeah, want to keep them. Yeah, well, because people are like, well, this is you know, well, we have holograms now, so they can get holograms. Yeah. Just get you know Tupac give, give at everyone. the Rosetta Stone. Yeah, I mean, apparently, <laughs> apparently, uh, Nicholas Reeves, not to be confused with Christopher Reeves, he <laughs> he he discovered that that room based on a hologram. Not, he wasn't. It's not a it was some kind of digital representation. Uh, right? They did. They did a. a, I a, a, a <laughs> it is not a hologram. It was. A, it's a, they they read. They did a reconstruction of Tut's tomb, like a whole. They they sounds like a hologram. A hologram is like light. <laughs> it's I, not I, like you can okay, put your hand I, through a when hologram. I, when I read that story, I, I imagined it as like there was like a box and a light thing came, and he was like, "That's where it is," because that's how he talked about it. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's right. not like that scene in Star Wars where yeah, Leia yeah, is like. That's, that's what I imagined. That not, that's that exactly what I imagined when I read that story. I was like, "Wow, how fascinating!" And he's like, and they, he didn't even have to come to Egypt. He had the hologram pop up, and he was like, "I believe Nefertiti is buried there." Yeah. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, no, because like when they made this. Complete. They just like redid the entirety of Tut's tomb next to it, so people would visit Tut's tomb instead of going to the original one because it's got a mold situation, and okay. they want to preserve it. Okay. So they did a full scanning, okay. and they did like all the imaging, so they could do like a massive kind of three D printing of okay. this. So it was a physical print. But they had to 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 scan all the images, and they had to do like a very detailed photography, okay, like three dimensional scanning of the entire okay. place. So he was able to look at the images that okay. Facta Marte is the company that did it. So he was able to look at the Facta Marte images okay. and blow them up really big on the computer and like really like get a okay. get a good look. So the hologram was on the computer, is what you're saying? It is. <laughs> yes, exactly, oh, uh. exactly. You have a clear understanding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But yeah, um. <laughs> Whatever. It was pretty cool. I thought that was an interesting story. I was hoping it was real, but it wasn't. I was hoping it was real, too. Yeah, because it would have been just a great find. It would have been really cool. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But also also kind of sad, actually, because, like, Nefertiti was this incredible woman. And why stash her behind and why, yeah. Like, yeah. I, I want, exactly. if they do find Nefertiti, I want her to yeah. have, like, a beautiful, massive tomb. I want the finest of the finest in there. Like, you know, Mm-mm. she deserves some major respect. Like, you know, it would be nice if she had, like, her, like, proper tomb. Um, I don't know if, like, maybe you don't feel comfortable, like, airing this kind of thing out. But, like, do you have any, like, epic theories of where you think certain individuals are buried that you would like to share? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like, I mean, no. <laughs> mm. it's, it's one of those, you know. Okay. You're, you, you've already said you're not the type of... of it's not like, it's, it's not, not my thing. thing. It's not, it's not thing. my thing. It's not thing. And I mean, it's cool if something is found. I would totally yeah. be into it and like read about it. But like, yeah. Yeah. no. Okay. <laughs> mm. um, but that, I mean, at that point, you might as well just, you know, write a historical fiction novel or something. Yeah. Cause mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Are you working on anything like that? I remember you had some you had some books that you were, you were doing like ages ago when we oh, spoke. Oh, but that's you had not. Like, you had like a novel and like a memoir and stuff. Yeah, but that's that's somehow. No time for that these days. Well, I wrote it. Oh. And I sent it to agents, but nobody wanted to represent me. It's hard. Yeah. So it's I mean, really I sent there. it to like only like twelve. So I yeah. I mean, if I was a uh, a functioning human being, um, well, I mean, I have like a lot on my plate, but like if I if I could manage my time better. Uh, I would like to, you know, there's like all these kind of workshops now that are, yeah. you know, Zoom-based where you can yeah. like work on pitching to agents and stuff like that. So I 
I should, if I was wise, do some of these and get, get, you know, help on my query letter and like maybe get more connections to, to this. But I, I mean, yeah, it would be, be fantastic if, if, if I could get an agent. Um, but that's it. You know, it's like everyone, it's so weird that like I'm an Egyptologist, which is like one of the things that people would love to do. And I'm like, I'd love to be a novelist too. Like, you know, I have, you know, everybody has a dream job, you know, out there mm. that they, they, they strive to do. So that would be, yeah, that'd be really cool. Yeah. Like, you know, in my complete dream fantasy life, I would, you know, be writing novels and just going on excavations and I wouldn't be... You're like halfway there, though. Yeah. You're you already going on excavations novel. and you've written a novel. Yeah. yeah so. but I think it's, to do that and to make, you know, keep going, that's a, that's a hard one. Um. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Eventually. Um, Maybe. Mm. We can wrap this up, but... Um, okay. Well, I'd like to end by asking you two some things. Go ahead. So, are what? You're Egyptian, mm-hmm. you, and you've been here for ages. Do you guys go to a lot of sites? Like, mm, I, uh, no, I don't. I really wish I would. Yeah, we want to. Yeah, yeah. more. We well, we 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 kind of. I we had made, to. We, should, we met in Luxor, kind of. Yeah, we were both. We sent were, an assignment. We, we, this relationship began, began in, Luxor. in Luxor, not the one we told you about, but one before that. No, no, was it that no, no, one? It was, was that, that one? one. It was the Nefertiti. That's, that's that was like our that first was, date. Yeah. Wait, the Nefertiti tomb. Nefertiti. Yes. You guys met at the Nefertiti well, tomb. No, opening? no, we, we met worked in together. the office, mm-hmm. but we got sent on the same assignment, <gasps> and then that was became a thing. Yeah, that was the weekend. That was our our our, our weekend. Yeah, so Nefertiti brought uh-huh. us together. Oh my goodness! Yeah, so we didn't find Nefertiti, but we found love. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> I love it. Was, uh, November twenty fifteen. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. That is romantic. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is great. Yeah. But I uh, know it would it would be lovely to go to more sites, honestly. I'm yeah. always disappointed in myself. We Me should too. make time for yeah. it. But the thing is, let's admit it, like it's really hot most of the year, so <laughs> That's that was yeah. But that, that's actually yeah. my 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 biggest thing. I'm always yeah. like I would love to go to these places, but it's just I'm, I'm always so worried about the heat. Is that is that is that is that a very terrible thing to say? No. <laughs> where where no. Where, 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 where should, should the should uneducated go? go? Like yeah. like I've seen we, we went to like the main Oh, I guess you went with me. I've been, I've been to most of the sites and like the big sites in Luxor, but that's kind of it. The Luxor is so beautiful. It's the gorgeous there. Yeah, it's stunning. Yeah, I mean Aswan is gorgeous too. I haven't been. Yeah. Oh my goodness! Since like I was a kid, then like was Aswan's amazing. Aware of what was going yeah, on. Yeah, Elephantine Island is incredible. Like the yeah, settlement yeah, yeah, there, yeah. it's gorgeous. Take me to Aswan. Yeah, yeah, we'll go. You guys need to go and feel it. Feel it is like one of the most beautiful temples yeah. in the entire world. It's like stunning on this yeah. island. Um, but even like locally, I mean, Saada is amazing. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, Giza, like going to the Giza pyramids is anxiety inducing. Um, Why? To say the least. It is so crowded. Yeah. And oh, it's yeah. just like. Well, apparently not so, well, no, maybe not, not, during, not so crowded maybe not during anymore. Corona. Yeah. Yeah. And Corona is maybe the time. I do like go. going to the pyramids. Yeah. Yeah. But Saara, like Saqqara is so much. Like just for your people, it's more relaxed. Mm. It's and like the kind of variety of things that you can easily see there from like the step pyramid and and the temple, like the complex surrounding it. And then you have like the beautiful old kingdom tombs that you can walk into, and then this like mm. you know, pyramid of Unas and the you know, pyramid yeah. text. I mean, there's like so many things, and it's beautiful out there. And then you can have like lunch, you know, on the Sahara Road. And there's so do you many have a nice favorite places. place? Like what? What's what's your favorite site? My, I mean, I think Saqqara is my Saqqara mm. is my favorite site. Okay. So That's, we should just go to Saqqara. Yeah. Have you been? Yeah. Like the very first time I came to uh, yeah. there. But it was like so long ago. So there's I have to go back. so much stuff there. Just walking around. It's really beautiful. Mm. That's probably my favorite one to go to, to visit. Mm. Um, yeah. I used to actually think, this is, this is really sad, but I used to think, I wasn't, I wasn't really into, into any of it for, for a long time. Yeah. Until, uh, until I was sent on an assignment there at some point and I just, I was like, just amazed by how beautiful it was. Yeah. But it took me, it took me a long time. I was like in my mid twenties, but for a long time I was like, I don't know what like the hype is about type of thing. You know, I, I didn't care. Yeah. I mean, okay. I I get it. And like, I know mm. like my mom and my grandma were visiting me here and I, I was busy. I was working, so I couldn't go with them. But I sent them on, you know, one of the the Luxor Aswan Nile cruises, and they came back, and they were like, "I never want to see anything from ancient Egypt ever again in my life." What? Because it's just like it's overload. You know, it's just yeah. like temple uh, after temple after thing, yeah, and they're yeah. like, oh, "I'm done." Mm. You know, so I mean, and you know, sometimes you go to a site, and it can maybe be a little accessible, inaccessible to understand, and you know, it's. Decoding the Egyptian museum in Tahrir has always been a challenge. Oh yeah, I love that museum so much. I, I, I think I it's love really it. beautiful as well. 
um, from the outside. From the inside, it's like it's, it's, it's just a bit dusty. It is, it is it's a museum of a museum. It's very meta. Yeah. <laughs> it's a museum of a museum. How? So like it's it reflects museum practice of like the 1920s. Okay. Ah. You know, and so it's like a museum. Hmm. And it's also like it's a museum of, of Egyptian artifacts. And it's also a museum of, of curatorship mm. a long, long time ago. Um, and like I, I know the museum really well and I love it. And you always, like you just like you can always discover something there. If you go to the second floor, you're like, I always find something new that I had That's never cool. seen before just because there's just so much and yeah. it's so cool. Yeah. I love the museum downtown. It's a cool museum. The yeah. problem is I've never been with you or someone like knowledgeable. So like, you I have to take, it to, to take us to Saara or we'll she's, take you. She's, she's <laughs> I don't know. We'll go busy. together. Yeah. Well, I mean, I actually, you know. If you ever feel like going to Saara, please take us with you. Is, I mean, is how, uh, oddly, oddly enough, <laughs> is though. Is how we should. Is the respectful, the respectful way to phrase it. Yeah, that. exactly. <laughs> you laugh, but I mean, I'm going to be doing a lot more field trips. So next semester, I'm teaching the Intro to Ancient Egypt class. Um, just take us with your students, yeah. Well, I mean, I want to do just like. Be like um, <laughs> these are just my <laughs> friends who decided to come with us. <laughs> I would love to do practice before I take my students to some of these sites. Just to be like. Because, you know, I know a lot of sites, but in ways that I would approach them or, you know, it's nice to do like a run through of like, okay, yeah. I'm going to take people and I'm going to go through mm-hmm. the major things and talk about stuff. And that'd be kind of fun. Yeah, yeah. Use this as practice. Practice on us anytime. Okay, I'll yes. practice on anytime. you guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like guinea awesome. pigs. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. We don't know anything. <laughs> oh. Unfortunately. Yeah. You know, I need to, yeah. We need to, we need to, we need to learn more. Way, way more. Yeah. It's but just this, like, I mean, how much can we, like... There's so much pressure, I think, on all of us to know and do so much. Yeah. Like, there mm-hmm. is just a limit to what, you know, you can use your time to and learn and understand. Modern Egypt is is itself super fascinating. Oh. You can just spend your whole life on the 20th yeah. century here and just find so much stuff. I know. Mm. So I, I've, like, never gotten past that. So getting, yeah. getting into Egyptology is, like, yeah. it's always there. I'm like, God, yeah. i got to know more about that. Well, it's, mm. like, for me, for... Because you're, you're living here. And yeah. You're, yeah, so... But I feel this way about Islamic Cairo. I'm, like, it's you know, I don't... Uh, I don't know as much as I would like to about it. So anytime I have a friend that knows something and then wants to go, I'm like, yes, please tell me more. You mm, know, like, yeah. let's go on a walk. I want to see this. Because I just, you know, also, I just don't know much about it. Like, I'm, you know. Do you go on the, have you ever been on the walks with uh, Patrick Ware and these these people? Should we be name dropping people in the middle of a podcast? I don't know. Hi, Patrick. Hi, Patrick, if you're watching this. He, he does these uh, walks all around historic parts of Cairo. He's super into it. He's, wow. I, I, yeah. I, do, do, do you know him? Was, I mean, I've seen those advertised. Like, they were on yeah. Cairo Scholars and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. But I never did any, and that's kind of a shame. Because mm-hmm. I just, like, I'm really, I am the worst. I'm the worst when I go to, like, archaeologicals. I cannot follow tour guides. I can't follow the people. I just wander off. Mm-hmm. So I really well, need to, it's, like... It's the nature of your job. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. I almost got kicked out of the Acropolis when I went to Athens. What did you do? I, just, I was just, just being like, me. Just, like, walked past the lines, like, that you're not supposed I was, to go I was past. Just, I was just, you know... Did you start just digging in the grass? <laughs> doing, <laughs> doing my thing, and they were not having it. Like, Tasting things. Ma'am, <laughs> ma'am, ma'am, there's no digging here. You ma'am. laugh. They had... Okay, so I went, and they had, like, you know, up coming up to the Acropolis, they have, like, little, you know, little stores, and I bought, like, a little mini bottle of wine, and I was like, okay, I'm wandering around. I have a little white wine, a little mini bottle. And I'm like, it's Europe, it's Greece, you can drink everywhere, it should be fine. So, like, I go... And I get, I take my little bottle and we go and we're sitting in this, like the theater of Dionysus and I'm just looking and I'm looking around and there's a piece of pottery on the ground. No way. I'm a ceramicist. So I just, every piece of pottery I see on the ground, I just pick it up and I take <laughs> a look at it. I just look, I just look. I looked at it. I looked at the inside, I looked at the outside, I look at the clay. I'm like, oh, this is very nice. Okay. And I put it down and I'm about to walk off. And then I heard a whistle, <sighs> ma'am. And this like woman was like on a lifeguard chair and she chased me down. Oh, and no. she was like, what did you do? And I was like, I'm sorry, what? She's like, well, you picked up something. And I was like, yeah. And she's like, what did you do? And I was like, well, I, I, I picked up that piece of pottery just to look at it. And she's like, this one? She picked it and she threw it. Oh, what? She threw it and she was like, you can't touch things. Don't she pick threw, anything up. She threw it. She threw it. She was so mad. She threw it away because like, like threw it far from me because I was going to like, I don't know, pick it up and put it in my pocket. I don't know. But she like very much was like, no touching. Was it destroyed? You can't. But- <laughs> I mean, of course. I mean. She was concerned. She destroyed it, I'm sure. But yeah. she, like, you know, she she was so concerned that I was going to pick it up and put it in my pocket. She freaked out. <laughs> so I was like, oh, my God. Okay. All right. No touch in pottery, which this is my entire, like, for the last 17 years, I've been going to archaeological site. I pick up pottery. I look at it. I put it right back down. Like, this is my job. I know what yeah. I'm doing. Yeah. I was like, oh. I was so taken aback. So then I kept wandering. And then there was a beautiful view. So I, I sit on the bench. 
I open my little mini bottle of wine, like the size you get on the little airplanes, and I start taking a few sips. And then who comes up from behind the bench? The, the same woman. Yeah. <laughs> and she was like, there's no drinking on the Acropolis. I was like, what, really? I was like, I thought you could drink everywhere. And she's surprising. like, there's no drink. So she took my bottle of wine, she <laughs> dumped it out, and I was like, okay, that's an offering to Dionysus, I guess. And she threw it in the trash can, and she told me one more thing I'd be thrown out of the Acropolis. And I was like... <laughs> I was, I'm like, <laughs> so I mean, she clearly was just having a really bad day. <laughs> also, I, I mean, I guess that is misbehaving at an archaeological site. Yeah. I mean, you know, I should have a sign. Don't touch the they pottery. Probably do. they I mean, probably, I'm sure they probably, probably do, but like, yeah. I just, you know, this is. But also, if I am in a group, I will wander. I can't, I can't stay with the yeah. tour guide. I like, I'm, I'm awful. Yeah. So I like to go with just like one person or two people who know what they're talking about. You know, do the thing, and I can't. Like, I just cannot pay attention. Mm. Yeah. People, even even if it's a charismatic person guiding, I'm like, mm. yeah, <laughs> wandering away. Yeah. So, but I should still try to do the walking tour because it sounds cool. Have you ever given tours here in in Egypt, people? Uh, it is very illegal for me it's to give tours. Illegal for you to give tours. Oh wow. Because there's a tour guiding syndicate, and you have to be a oh. a member, and you have to be part oh. of it, and so I I can't. I don't give tours. I mean, I'll take like a, like a friend or a family yeah, member, like yeah. one, but I can't, you know, I can't do tours, hmm. and you know, that's not. Like Has a, that always been the case? It's been the case for a while. Foreigners are just not allowed to give tours. Yeah, mm. huh. I mean, for for money, yeah, um, yeah, or yeah. bigger tours. I mean, and it, you know, Mm-mm. it makes sense to a it different. Makes, yeah, you know, yeah. The, I mean, they you you. you I mean, it makes sense for Egypt. Like, I think in other countries, maybe. All right. Um, thank you so much for yeah, coming. Thank you so You're much. You're welcome. This was super, we learned super so much. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. yeah.